stands for responding quickly to what they need. And E is evaluation of whether you have actually been able to connect with them well and able to relate with them well. So uh, COVID, this pandemic, like uh, this gentleman, I think he's called a close Schwab, the head of the World Economic Forum, said that this pandemic opens a new window of opportunity for us to see people, to see our organizations as people-centric, to see Stambik Bank as leading now in a purpose first, delivering value beyond money to everyone and every stakeholder. So there have been very important lessons. It's a window of opportunity to reflect, to reimagine, to rethink how, who we are, how we operate, and also how we grow. I, I thank you very much, Maurice. Doctor, I don't want to let you go, and I'm very excited that you're here because you're very passionate about this conversation, and it's clear that, um, you know, in your coaching, your, your daily coaching uh, engagements, it's something you've been driving on with the value of leadership, the value of leadership. Um, so, as you mentioned, COVID brought the best out of the best leaders. So, we, we can clearly see that uh, those leaders who seemed to have been prepared to manage a crisis yes. managed COVID better. And uh, the difference we have discovered is that those who are more compassionate, yes. their productivity and the businesses uh, within which they led yes. have actually done better within this crisis. Um, as you coach leaders, um, is this something that you've consistently spoken to? The idea that you're not just a leader for the top line, mm. but you're a leader for humanity uh, and you should be cognizant of the relationship you're building with your staff. Yes, we, we do talk about, uh, most of the leaders uh, 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 might be lucky, that most of the leaders that we have conversations of this type with are already super sold to the fact that before you get people's hands, you must have their hearts first. Uh, so you can buy somebody's hands to do work, but you may not need to buy, you may not buy the hands. And the, the survey that was done by PwC recently uh, around East Africa, so I found that, you know, you have about 20% of the people in an organization who are, you know, completely committed to the work, who are really fully engaged. Now, you have about probably 55% of people who are disengaged, and it's probably 25% who are actively disengaged. So uh, people matter a lot. Why? Because... Uh, you, 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 you may like, uh, I think uh, a lady called uh, Angelou Maya said, people will forget what you said. They will forget even what you did. But they will never forget how you made them feel. Mm. Uh, and feeling is so important. And that is hidden from us leaders, the way the hearts of people feel. Are you authentic? Are you credible? Can you be trusted? Here we are in a pandemic. Uh, and, and you need their initiative, resourcefulness, and positive energy to stretch the mile further. You will see most of the banks here have made profit. They have posted profit. The way I come from, we posted uh, an enormous lot, 12.5%. Don't be surprised yeah. to mention NSSF. So, uh, NSSF uh, is, is our drive, bank. <laughs> to drive initiative and resourcefulness and positive energy comes from the heart. And that's when people trust the environment. Yeah. Are our leaders willing to listen? Yeah. Are they willing to listen? Uh, because do they feel the same way? Some of us are hurting. We have now cases of uh, mental stress. Yes. Uh, uh, there, there are many people who are walking, but they died a long time ago. So Berio has just delayed, <laughs> but they have already died. So can the leaders connect? Can we have a better connection? And so, so the conversation is really around people-centric organization. Stambik is a very good example of this, that they have bent backwards to accommodate unusual circumstances that people are facing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. I'll come back to you. I wanted to ask Isaac. Isaac, as a, a leader in one of you know, the region's leading logistics companies, um, I, I, as I spoke to you before we started, uh, you know, truck drivers um, were forgotten as frontline workers. And this pandemic taught us that truck drivers were very critical in our life because they moved the goods we were procuring um, every single day from point A to point B. Um, they were... Uh, you know, in the entire conversation around COVID, they became very critical on where do we test them from, um, where do they pack when they are traveling in country. They were asked not to talk to people and interface with the, you know, the Wanainchi. And uh, they were still very critical in, uh, you know, doing business in East Africa and in the region um, and connecting us to the rest of the world because of what they were bringing um, in, in country. 
as a leader, um, how was it like dealing with that caliber of people that were very critical in our economy, but also had, you know, as a person, you know, they also had family and you had to think about that. And they were staying years and, I mean, days and, and months away from home because they couldn't interface with anyone. How, how was it like dealing with uh, that group of people and, of course, managing uh, the logistics business during this period? Maurice, uh, um, I think before I say anything about that, I think it's to actually say the COVID uh, pandemic is still, we shouldn't discuss it as if it is past. This is the first correction I want us to, because you're asking the question as if it is in the past. It is actually a live show. It's a live story that is, continues to take shape. Um, for us in the logistics world, we are still very much possibly in the middle or somewhere of it. It's taken different directions. Uh, of course, the first uh, months was about life. We had an enemy whose character and behavior we had no idea. So we asked, the government asked our drivers, of course, to, to continue to work, which was you know, a no-brainer. We needed to, we are landlocked, so we must continue to get supplies. Uh, but you see, a, a truck driver is first a human being. He's also worried about life. But he's also worried about the livelihood, about his job. And you must help them to think through. So our first challenge was to keep them safe in the vehicles and fed. Because we only give them a truck and money and say, go to Mombasa and bring cargo. And they figure out where to eat. But in the first weeks, they were being chased. They could not stop anywhere and be fed. When they stopped to go get a, a soda, they were said, Corona, Corona, we have videos of them. And people ran away from them. So it quickly dawned on us as leaders to actually provide dry rations to them. So biscuits, glucose, drinks, you know, bottle of water, things we never had to do. And we packed them in the vehicles. So that's one thing. Then, then you realize you can't live on dry rations for a week. So they said, boss, now we need to be able to cook for ourselves. Now you have to figure out how to, so at different stations you buy, you buy um, stoves, you buy different things for them. You, you now create centers for them to be able to look after themselves. But, but the worst part was when now they started to be tested. And they were the, they were the guinea pigs of testing. You know, they were no, their noses were poked, they started bleeding, they collapsed. Because there were, no one knew how to actually do this thing. And they had to be tested every time they come. And actually, it's at that point that we engaged the healthcare providers, the health ministry of health, you know, to ask if there was an alternative to the nasal uh, swab. And this, that, then they started to say, okay, you could do a, an orofaryngeal, uh, the one in the mouth, an orofaryngeal swab. And we asked whether it was necessary to do it every time the driver came, so they started to space it to every two weeks, which meant that in two trips you could be tested once. Uh, but when they fell sick, the first lot, they were treated in a way that was, no one wanted to touch them, be near them. They were excommunicated. They were put in a place. We could, the phones were taken. We had no idea what, but then they've got family. So we had to figure out to get our own van. So whichever driver got taken away, we bought food, took it to their homes. We had to figure out how to get to their homes when their phones are off. So you ask driver so-and-so who seems to know where Morris lives, and the story goes on. But, but more importantly, when they came back, they couldn't go home. So how do they change clothing? So the families have to, it's a long story, but, uh, but I think as frontliners, we have learned that as, as leaders, we, you know, we were faced with a challenge, and I, I don't want to brag that we've actually figured out, but we've managed. Our trucks have never been packed. And fortunately for, for our company, we haven't lost a driver. They are much young, most of them. We had to replace the older ones, about 50. We, we put them as reserve, so we took them out of the, the cabins to, to be safer. And ultimately, it became a cost. You know, we were doing the maths for us. In the last 12 months, we've added a cost of testing of hundreds of thousands of dollars as a company, which it goes straight to bottom line. 
and, and the story goes on and on. But I think most importantly, we have not lost a life. And most importantly, we've continued to serve our clients. We've not given excuses of being unable to deliver for our clients because of the situation. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Um, I, I'll be coming back to you because it would be nice to hear you know, some of the stories of um, you know, the, the, the drivers and how uh, the, the company related with, with the drivers to be able to, to you know, keep them on the job because there was fear, not just the stigma, but also the fear to, to, to get the virus, the fear um, you know, uh, of the stigma they, of their families were facing in the communities, but how you kept these drivers on the job despite the, the circumstances. But I want to go to uh, Thaddeus um, Soke, who is uh, the acting Casita chair. Uh, Thaddeus, the, it's known to everyone that, um, and you, you did even physically protest anyway, so we all know that uh, uh, the traders were heavily affected by the, the pandemic. Um, the first lockdown uh, was a proper lockdown for the Casita family because uh, shops were closed, business was closed, and yet um, these are people with families, uh, these are people uh, that had uh, picked loans from Stanbic Bank, and, and these are people that needed uh, to stay on the job to survive. So it was not just livelihood, but also um, to, to remain alive, they needed to, to work. And so we saw that on the street. But as a leader, um, Casita, we want to know how you managed that crisis at the beginning. And yes, Isaac, I've not forgotten that COVID is still here with us. We're learning to live with it. Um, how you managed that initial crisis and how... Um, as a leader, you dealt with that, you know, initial stress of your staff, your, your colleagues are out of work, you're out of work, um, people have to fend for their families, but they also have loans they must pay back. Um, how was that initial stage of the pandemic? Thank you very much. Uh, for sure, COVID caught us unaware. I can't lie that we businessmen, we are so good at saving. You know, we know that at tomorrow I'm going to get money. Next day I have to order things from China. So on my side, my, my friend thinks we are not easy at all. So because of that shock, I had to spend more time at my home office trying to reflect what step can I take, what can I do. And by then my phones... I used to overring because people needed the answers. Uh, and by that time, I was the Secretary General of Casita, and we are seriously engaging with my former boss, the late currently, Everest Kayondo. And totally, we are thinking, what can we do? Uh, given the fact that uh, we do make recommendations to the government on policy level, uh, we are lucky that we are, we are selected to represent the business community on the COVID task forces, so that we can present our challenges and interests. So, because it was partially done, they first locked some bars, uh, gyms, and others. So when we are engaging the ministers, we ask them now, how are we going to explain to our business people that they are incurring rent areas because it's a presidential directive? The minister was so clear. He told me, Mr. Presidential directives are not debated on at all. <laughs> Tell your colleagues to make sure they comply. And we request, please, make sure we sensitize the business community in order to, to control the spread of COVID-19 with the urgency. So we established a team. And uh, most, most of my colleagues told me now, Mr. Musoki, where is our bus? Where is our allowances? <laughs> you know Ugandans with allowances. They know any, anything initiated by the government, there is of course money. And even like uh, the meetings we held at KCCA, you hear councillors re requesting for money. So I had, to, I had to present and say, do we as the business community, when COVID strikes, uh, all the restrictions affect us. So let us use the available resources as CASITA to make sure we sensitize our members, uh, mainly that what we could do, and we thought that we could not go in total lockdown. Unfortunately, uh, because they told us when we comply, 
the president will not lock us. Unfortunately, the big man locked us. So now, again, we ask, now you see, my money is in the shops. My drugs are on treatment. What can we do? Maurice, you cannot believe that our members walked from Wakiso, uh, from uh, Mukono, and the, the metropolitan area. And the Kampala was fully crowded until police started to fight them. Because we are not even used to staying home. You know, for us, we have a lot of us, us. You know, we know that you are supposed to make money. <laughs> and like when sometimes when, uh, when I'm having some presentations, I tell colleagues that uh, for us in business, mainly we consider money so fast than even by their life. Uh, because even you had refused to issue out recommendation letters, you cannot believe that when COVID was so serious in China, Ugandans wanted to go to China. Ugandans wanted to go to Dubai. And some were stopped from Addis. And then they returned them back here. I told them, hello, colleagues, when we talk to our partners in Dubai, it's worse. Why should you go to Dubai or China? So I'm trying to express that we businessmen, I'm sorry to say this, but money at times comes faster than health. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some people don't want to hear it. That's why even in our engagements with the president, we told him, let us work or we die, we die. Or we, <laughs> we survive, we survive because we need money, we have challenges, and we know our government cannot meet our obligations because we presented several recommendations which the government uh, for sure didn't honor at all. Uh, so, during that, uh, the, during that challenging time, and we could not move, luckily enough, uh, I tried diversification. I'm also a journalist, so I got a sticker for journalists. You know, we businessmen, we try to maneuver and utilize all the opportunities. <laughs> so I used to move around, uh, visiting my colleagues to see how can, what can we do? How can we handle such a challenge? As I was still consulting, they told me, you, you are lucky, you can go to town. Now we are hearing that even uh, our goods have been destroyed because sometimes there are rain, we had some heavy rains. And you know we have buildings in Kampala, when it rains, mm. you find that shops flood. Downtown, quality sale around there. So what we did as a secretary general, and you know all my colleagues in Kasita didn't have stickers. So I was the big man moving. Have to interact with the press, have to interact with the business community. So we had to engage the landlords to see how can we save our, our goods. And uh, some business lady and women, uh, ladies and men who had, access, who had accessed the town, when they reached, we, discuss, we, discussed, uh, we discovered that most of our goods had been destroyed by the floods. Uh, on an unfortunate part, one of the lady corrupts and by they died because of pressure. And others, so we had several, several scenarios and it was very challenging on our side. Uh, so later what we did, we decided to engage the government. That given the fact that uh, people have, have complied, they are home, they no longer congest town, why can't we ease up? Because we had the sense that uh, you know, when we businessmen get some money, we want to buy those expensive cars. But people now had struggled to get goods from shops and start vending in those expensive cars. So you find that Nabugabo all was crowded. William Street was almost crowded. So in order to survive, they had to, to, to connect with their customers, to call them. Because making a business money to stay home a whole day is <laughs> not very easy. So with that scenario, because they needed money, and for the posho, the beans which the government was giving out, we are not able to access. Uh, like in Mukono, where also I have some investments, what uh, like I did as Musoke, because when I was engaging the former RDC, he told us we have a challenge of fuel and distribution. I, had, I have some trucks which I provided at a free cost and then I fueled them 
to make sure we can distribute okay. posho and beans. And then I have some schools in Mokono whereby my store we had just restocked. Uh, so for my teachers, we provided food, beans, and some money, and then our surrounding, and then our business community. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got a scenario that whenever I could come to any street, they know how so is giving out food. Yes. So people could come and crowd around. But in fear that police may arrest me because, again, I, I may be facilitating the spray of COVID. Uh, sincerely, with COVID-19, we were unaware. Right. I will come back to you because um, I, I had wanted Emma to speak to the interventions the bank um, had to come up with, especially uh, given the condition your customers were in. And, and we're not just talking about the traders um, who have loan facilities with you, but also... Um, the, the small and medium enterprises um, who were heavily affected, uh, some working out of their homes, whether they were small bakeries or confectionaries or, um, you know, industry, the smaller industries uh, operating wherever they were, that had facilities with you, but also um, were, uh, you know, probably like the traders having to deal with the, the issue of rent, even when they were not doing business. What was the role of the bank in this conversation and, and what were the interventions that speak to the compassionate leadership we are talking about um, the bank came up with? Thank you. Um, so I think the effects came in maybe four or five months uh, when we started seeing real effects in failure to pay uh, loans. So the initial, the initial thought by the banking industry was, okay, let's extend these loans. Let's give a moratorium. You know, and initially we all thought, okay, this thing is like three months, six months tops, we'll be done and go back to normal. But as we started getting into nine months, then the question to say, how, how many moratoriums can you give? How many extensions? Because when you have a loan running and you're given a moratorium, you're told, okay, pay interest, but you don't have to pay the principal for now. But that means the time you're going to keep that loan increases and therefore your cost of financing increases and yet you're not earning anything. So we did put in place the moratoriums, the extensions, but we also started to talk to our front office people to say, can you actually have a conversation with the, with the business owner to say, what else can we do? Because endless extensions is not going to be the answer. At some point you have to start paying. So, and also, can the extensions not be short-term? Maybe what was a short-term loan, if you had a school, for example, so we have a, 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 a product that we give to schools because at the beginning of the term, they need money, but in three months' time, they've paid us off. So we call it a flexi-loan. These flexi-loans haven't been paid for two years, so can we now make them term loans, term them up for a longer time so that even as the school opens in January, if they do open, they will not be... Uh, they won't have to suffer in the first few months trying to, to pay a loan for two years ago. So it's really to have the conversations with, the, with our customer to say, what should we do that is going to help you to survive? Now, unfortunately, some of our customers may not survive. So the question also is then, what do we do to recover the bank's money? Because again, it is you and, my, and I's money. It's not, uh, it's not free money. So again, getting our front-end people to have conversations with the customers. None of us brought COVID, so you can't blame <laughs> the other person. But there have also been areas where we can have conversations with government, for example, where our contractors have not been paid by government. So we go back to government and say, okay, these guys did their job, they completed. You actually have signed that they've completed, but there's no money to pay. How can we support you to pay them so that we also don't end up in a in a, in, a, in a worse of situation. So again, as a market leader, you have access that you can help with your customers. So having those conversations with government to say, um, how do we all work together to make sure that this particular sector doesn't suffer more than they're already suffering. So there's a, I think there was an, a directive that came through from the central bank this week about schools and how the banks should support schools into at least up to September next year. Again, that was in consultation with the Bankers Association and leading with the fact that schools have been our best customers up till now. 
they've been giving us good liabilities, they've been borrowing, we've been collecting their money. We were in a good relationship. So just because of COVID, they're in where, the, in the space they're in, not of their own making. But how can we give up, take some of that pain away by taking away the interest so that they can be able to get back. But also, most, more importantly, for our children. If a school that was serving a certain community actually goes under, there's already social impact on that community by the school not opening the last two years. But if it doesn't come back in January, that means that social impact actually increases long after you know, the real pandemic. So it's figuring out what, how best to, for everybody to survive as best as we can. Emma, I would want to see you to speak to um, the results of this relationship you built with your customers during this period and, and what, you know, what you discovered, what your lessons were, the lessons learned um, in your relationship with the customers who, like you said, you were talking to and hand-holding uh, through this process. What have you learned along the way, um, especially with those that you have been engaging uh, consistently with? during this crisis, uh, having to manage a crisis together? So we had a customer appreciation day about three weeks ago, and all of us as a bank were given specific customers to call, check on them, find out how they are. And the feedback we actually got uh, as management was that we showed compassion during this time. Um, another data point I could give you is that our restructured book has actually reduced, which means that some of the sectors are recovering and therefore being able to stay current with their loans. And again, um, we had probably first restructure, second restructure, and at the th instead of having a third one, they've actually recovered now. So there's some sectors that are recovering and you can start to see you know, the volumes are coming through, their banking, um, and, and that is, uh, is, is coming through. But another one is that through the pandemic, we've had these kind of engagements. We've talked about how do you uh, go online and start to market your, your business online. And again, our customers have found new opportunities along the way. So the feedback we're getting is that even if I'm opening my shop downtown, I still have my customers online and I have a firm grip on that distribution channel as well, and it's bringing in some good money. So again, um, finding the opportunities even in the crisis, because in a crisis there are actually opportunities. And I think uh, we also had another seminar where we're talking about uh, savings even in a business. Because like uh, my friend has said, they, ne they never save. We were on Medeyalero. Yes, the traders, they we, get money every day. So they uh -huh. never planned for this. But we had a conversation around savings, because reserves cannot only be for the individual. Even as a business, you need to have some level of reserves. And, and this, is, this is going to be now a continuous conversation, even as we're doing uh, our conversations with our customers to actually check on how much reserves have you built uh, in the event that there's another shock, where can you, where can you um, pick up? The most recent one was with actually Casita, where we realized there's a lot of goods seated in the URA bonds because people can't pay taxes. Meanwhile, URA is also a customer. On the other hand, is behind on their tax collections for the year. So can we actually create an opportunity where taxes are paid, the bank keeps maybe 50% of your goods, you go sell the 50% because at least your taxes won't be more than 50%. Pay us back, take the rest of your goods. So we're looking forward to this. I think we should have the first the first ones in this, uh, this week. We're looking forward to that partnerships where, where uh, we actually support uh, customers to pay off their taxes, redeem their goods from the bonds, and uh, on the other hand, government is able to get uh, taxes and, and collections because they're also incurring costs in keeping these goods in the mm. bonds. Demorage, so yes. again, being in a place where you can be able to support both sides, and uh, make some money while you're at it, because uh, we are also a commercial organization and not an NGO. <laughs> I, I <knew laughs> but you, at a good rate. I knew the executive, di rate. I knew the executive director knew <laughs> was going to come out at some point. No, Emma, thank you. Um, if you're just joining us, you're watching our Compassionate Leadership series with Stan Big Bank, and, and this is the first of many that will be coming um, your way, and we're discussing um, the role of our leaders um, in, in, in transforming our organizations and, and some of 
the leadership roles expected of them amidst such a crisis and how COVID, amidst the pandemic, um, we've learned to live with the virus, but I have had to change the way we do things. And if you're one of those who's been lucky to have benefited out of the pandemic, good for you. And, and that is innovative of you, but literally everyone was affected by the pandemic and um, the bank itself, uh, the, the staff themselves, and of course their customers. And that's the conversation we're having on how compassionate leadership um, turned around or is turning around the different organizations in, in, in the way they do things, uh, increasing the productivity among us, their staff, but also translating that into results. And so we'll be discussing much more in this conversation. And I wanted to go back to Dr. Kimboa. Um, doctor, so the results out there show that for most of the leaders who um, you know, had exemplary leadership skills to be involved in the lives of their people, uh, you've spoken the fact that you can buy their hands, but you don't necessarily, you cannot buy their hearts. And so it must be an action. You must be action oriented to be able to relate with them on a personal level. Um, most organizations were very quick to fire people when the, the, you know, the, the pandemic hit. Um, the first you know, intervention most organizations had was to reduce the numbers so that they're able to remain afloat. And yet, Stan Big Bank, and I probably will ask Emma why they didn't, Stan Big Bank, one of the biggest organizations in the country, never fired a single person. Um, but as you said, they've again posted profit. Yeah. Um, so what sort of leadership um, you know, would be defined, would have quickly defined the fact that firing people was not the alternative, but getting the results out of them despite the crisis was the way to go? Uh, thank you very much, Maurice. Um, well, maybe if I could use the example of the fund, uh, National Social Security Fund, uh, whatever I'm going to be talking about, I, I am not picking credit for this. Uh, my predecessors, Patrick Kaberenge and Richard and a number of people out there, they did all this work. So our predecessors uh, can claim the credit, and that's the credit I'm representing. That uh, in the f at the fund, I found a very interesting foundational principle uh, that uh, really uh, people are everything. So everything we, we're going through is about people. And there were four levels of preparation that I found at the fund. Number one was in the earlier first wave of COVID, and then the second one. And so they had what you'd call a people response plan or readiness. They were ready to provide emergency response. The number two, they also had, uh, and they have now, they, they had what you do call, how can people continue flourishing amidst all this uncertainty? So they had, again, readiness plan for this. Then recovery. How do we reach down to people and see exactly who is hurting, who is languishing, and who is... So that's more about staff engagement. And they were using multiple channels to reach out to people every day every day. Uh, and then the last one was scenario planning that was preparing should an event or a crisis like this happen again, how do we handle our people? At the fund, they didn't at all uh, lay off anyone. There was hybrid working, uh, without any doubt. Uh, uh, the office space was completely modeled. But we, the issue here, like I mentioned, close swab of World Economic Forum, when there's a pandemic like this, there are no easy solutions. But I think the biggest challenge is imagination, trying to reimagine the future. Think of new things. So at the fund, they are open-minded. They are curious and willing to adopt. And one of the things that they did was, number one, the, the different stakeholders. The board had to meet management very frequently without getting involved in their work, but engaging on what's the latest information. What are the trends? What, what, do we need to review what is not going well? What else do we have to look at? So they had a think box out there on creating new solutions, depending on the challenge and the way it was working. So now, in terms of stakeholders, the board and management worked very closely. No one was going to be sucked at all, because that was not the point. But a new level of thinking. A new level of thinking, how do we make sure that one, the employers, we can defer their payments, the monthly payments they pay to the fund. The, these were deferred, uh, and including the employees. Then you had the situation of the beneficiaries themselves. The, the, the ones who are taking the benefits from the fund. Uh, there was, I think, something called the invalidity benefit access, so that was provided. But like uh, my colleague uh, Emma mentioned, uh, then we had to go digital. 
and embed analytics within the process to speed up decision making. So access and availability of funds and help was there because there was digital process that was now put in place to make sure the beneficiaries access this well, including information. So uh, the idea of sucking people or laying off people is in itself an admission of failed imagination. The capacity to create value at minimum cost in the shortest time possible. So for most of the institutions, and I'm speaking from where I stand, uh, whenever there's a crisis and we see this at the fund, we've got a team of extraordinarily talented individuals whose job it is to challenge everything that is going right. In other words now, stretching the boundaries to the future. Should this crisis come again, we are ready. But we are not going to do any bloodletting. There's going to be nothing. So thank you very much. Thank you, doctor. I, 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 I'm, I'm really uh, happy about, you. you're literally giving us quotes every time you speak. Uh, you know, you know, firing people is a, is a lack of... Uh, uh, is, a, is, is not critical thing. Is a, 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 a abortion of imagination. Is a abortion of... <laughs> yeah, the imagination is aborted. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. Um, Isaac, let, let's come back to you know, the, the, the frontline worker and how the conversation of keeping them on the job was very critical. Uh, and they could have thrown in the towel. And I'm sure you got a couple of people saying, this is too risky now. Uh, I'm no longer interested. Um, I, I, they, as you mentioned, there were guinea pigs in, during this period. And so their families also came into play. And um, so keeping this gentleman on, on the job and also ensuring that um, he delivered on, on the job. Um, so how did you as, a, as, a, as an organization convince or even, you know, have the drivers stay on the job amid this, this crisis? Uh, and, and, and how did you do that as an organization? Yeah, thank you, Maurice. Um, really, the, the thing is, first we opened a factory at my home to make sanitizers because I bought, <laughs> I bought sanitizer, sanitizer for about a month my background is in pharmacy and chemistry, so I started making sanitizers myself. Thanks to COVID, now you have a new business line. I, sh I should actually take Imagination. <laughs> Imagination, because I worked it out. I mean, we were spending five million every week, you know, to keep every driver supplied with sanitizers. And we ended up doing it, you know, at home, I think it costs about a million shillings. It's now moved to our yard, our parking yard, that's where we make it. So we bought the, the canisters the first time, and when they're finished, we refill with ours. <laughs> um, and then we bought the biscuits. But the most important thing was to realize that now we needed to put in more people so people could go away. So where we, for every one truck, every 10 trucks, we have one extra person. Now we went one, for every 10 trucks, we have three extras. So there's Just a rotation of yes. people are taking, you know, leave more frequently. Uh, but I think more, more importantly is really to have, uh, at the end of uh, 2020, uh, management came and said, you know, the, the people who have given everything need uh, a COVID allowance. Now we have a COVID allowance as part of our pay structure to recognize that these people have gone an extra mile. While most of us are working from home in the safety of our families, they are on the road literally uh, and, and sticking it out for us. But, but I think the other thing we've done really now is, is to rewrite our health and safety policies because they were written pre-COVID. And, and the risks we imagined were accidents and other things, but actually now the, the more likely risk is COVID. So we've rewritten. We've gone back and re-updated our health and safety, a whole new manual. And, and that, that is now a, a big part of, uh, of our human resource. Um, so I think it's not easy, like I said, to, to look at you're losing money because we are, we are, we were losing money during COVID. For, for a truck, a trucking business to make money, you need to go, those of us that go to Mombasa three times a month with the stoppage, the tests and wait, you test wait 48 hours, a trip is gone. If you're lucky, you I, make I think, two trips. I think now you're surprised that in two hours, people are getting results at the airport. And your drivers had to wait for yeah, 48, 48 hours, hours before but, they could cross. But when you lose a trip, and then you must add another two drivers for every 10 trucks, 
you're, you're moving towards red. And it's so easy for you to say, forget it. I think it's compassion that says, you know, we've been making money in the good times, we will make money in the good after times, because crisis. it's after this, after this. Um, and I think that the, the only thing that one looks after in a sustainable way, if you're going to remain in business, is the people. The, drug, the truck can't drive itself. It can't load itself. We are not yet there with AI. We are not yet there with AI. So you have to look after people. But, but more importantly, for every truck driver that you see, there is a group of admin people who have to support them. And, and like Stanbic, we were all desk, desktop based, so we had to buy them laptops. When you buy a laptop, you have to put data. Yes. And, and, you, <laughs> and then you have to realize, okay, now we have to pay teams for Teams, Microsoft, so that we are connected. I think the real thing that has happened, that once we invested that, then it became much easier to engage. We have a conversation every morning with almost everybody, because technology now, the infrastructure is paid for. And PK spoke about engagement. You know, we've got staff in Kampala, in Malaba, in Mombasa, in Namave, at, at Nakawa, at our head office. We could never have spoken every morning. Now we do. And the engagement levels speak for themselves and the productivity. So I think it's, like I said, it's a developing story. We don't know how it ends, but there's a clear silver lining on this dark cloud. All right. Okay. The engagement. Okay. Um, Tadeo, uh, you know, the people downtown need to continue <laughs> hearing your name. Um, so, Casita, you know, is a, an umbrella body for traders. Um, yes. And uh, I, I think we saw you all um, during this, uh, I mean, you know, in, at the end of the first lockdown, um, even with the second lockdown, you, you, you were the voice of the traders. But I wanted to know more what. What, mar uh, what more did you do as, as Casita to support the traders amidst that crisis? The rent, the, 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 ta the, the issue of, 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 of taxes, the issue of uh, you know, their loans. What was your role as Casita in supporting um, the traders? Thank you. Uh, you know, when we had several challenges, uh, first of all, for the loans, we immediately started engaging banks uh, because uh, the, the loan alias had accumulated and uh, even our members were scared that the banks may take my car house or my car. Uh, so uh, the banks, we engaged with them, we had to bargain with them. And then later they said, you know, for us our hands are tied. Because we used to, to meet on Zoom. Uh, and then we suggested, let us engage uh, Uganda Bankers Association. But all the engagements, you find that, uh, like my sister said, that they are not NGOs. <laughs> As Solita, what we decided, we had challenges of loan alias, rent, and uh, even we needed recapitalization. So when we met the minister by that time, he was Honorable Amelia. At this time, we are engaging with Honorable Bahati and Harriet. Uh, the other first lockdown, we had to drive to Entebbe. And we elaborated so well to the president. So the president said, Casita, this time you have taken over a uh, state house. <laughs> because we had points, and for sure, also, he didn't have immediate answers. He promised us that he's going to engage the bankers to make sure they, at least they soften. And really, they have softened. Although, again, we are not very happy with them. <laughs> we, we have paid interest when we are home. Uh, and we tried to engage them, but they had several, several, several explanations, which I think were beyond. And uh, given the fact that when we are at university, they teach us about management, there are, there are issues which the manager can handle, and beyond. And now, like this crisis of COVID, so what we did for rent, we decided, because the president could not assist, we decided to go to court. The landlords won us. <laughs> so, so we have to pay court costs. So when we are meeting the board, we decided, what can we do? Given the fact that most of the landlords are members of Casita, they are traders, can't we reconcile? And then we engage them. I think, I think with that strategy we won somehow. As some landlords were cooperative, 
uh, some we are not cooperative, but those who cooperated, at least our traders were bailed out. And those who didn't, up to now, traders failed to pay the, those rent alias. The shops were closed. So when we engaged some of the landlords, uh, we tried to reason them. You are demanding six millions, two to two millions per month. But now the shop has been closed for two years. So you are losing a lot of money. As some landlords who took law by their hands, you have seen some of them being arrested. When you open by my shop by force, then courts of law have to come what? Come to assist. And even our we have our mediation team. So now they know you cannot forcefully uh, remove a trader in the shop, you're supposed to engage. So we thought as the business community, having engagements and finding solutions together can easily formulate solutions. Uh, like, you know, banks are part of the private sector. These engagements have totally yielded great results. You find that um, my sister, she hasn't explained so well. Uh, now, like for us, for schools, sincerely, the banks have tried to bail us out. They have even reduced on the rate. They have reduced on the rate because we told them now, you gave us this money basing on our cash flow. So we are not generating anything. Just imagine, have a colleague, he, actually, he got like 200 million, he was trying to expand her kindergarten section. Now, two years, she's not working. So what does it imply that they, 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 they run alias accumulate? So, but given with this special package, uh, I think through the engagements with different stake agencies and them, because they knew, because we are clients and we had a very strong relationship with them, we are paying. Uh, it has at least yielded some reway for school recovery and other sectors and even confiscation of property, like taking over property, you find by the time the bank takes off your property, it has tried all avenues. Uh, so yes, COVID has affected our business so negatively, but I think our bankers somehow, uh, they have been a little bit lenient, uh, uh, given the fact other, other, other challenges, I think with several engagements, uh, we shall be assisted. Uh, uh, my main concern was, you know, with passion. Very quickly, yes. Uh, yes, just briefly. You know, we found a challenge that we need to maintain the workers, but your cash flow has been affected. So what could you do? We told our traders, unless you reduce on the number of employees, because you find that the salary areas will keep on accumulating. And then you are going to bring you to Casita because you have failed to pay what? Salaries. What do you do? Talk to them. If they can accept, you can reduce on the salary structures. If they cannot, give them a package so that life can continue. There is somebody, they have tried to, to, to start up something small. And at Casita, we are trying to see how can we fund those startup businesses. We, we are looking for partners to see how can they be assisted. Stan Bick is here, don't worry. Yes. <laughs> you just need to talk to Emma nicely. <laughs> okay. Yes. So that's what I wanted to see that, uh, to, to, to try to enlighten because at times you can decide as a leader, not because you want, but because of the challenges. Uh, because you need these employees, they are part of the institution, or part of your shop, or part of your enterprise. But you cannot. Others, what we told them, try to diversify. Uh, now even traders are investing in agriculture. Traders now are allocating from, the, from Kampala Central business area to metropolitan area because business was moving on smoothly. So, you know, we are supposed to be a little bit more dynamic, I think, uh, given the fact because in uh, scenarios of pandemics. All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Tadeo. Uh, if you're watching us, we want to take um, a break uh, because, you, you know, we need to give Peter, uh, Isaac, and uh, Emma some coffee. Uh, but also we want to allow you at home to walk um, uh, to the washroom or get a cup of coffee and, and join us again for this conversation because this conversation continues. We are looking at lessons learned and testimonies, um, the experience of the pandemic, but also a way forward. Um, how 
we can drive compassionate leadership as a value, a leadership value for our organizations as we continue this, uh, uh, you know, com compassionate leadership series with Stanbic Bank. So please do not go anywhere. It is where I belong I know I won't wait long For my favorite song I can tell by the way For us, improving lives is why we do what we do. Question. What does freedom mean? Freedom means caring for those that need you the most. It means living life to the absolute fullest. It means zipping through those everyday tasks so you can spend more time with those you love. Freedom means flexibility. Freedom means flexipay. FlexiPay is a brand new way of thinking about your financial life. With the FlexiPay wallet, you can perform a number of tasks that will make managing your finances easier and safer. From simple transactions like sending and receiving money from bank accounts, mobile wallets or debit and credit cards, to everyday things like paying for goods and services and paying school fees and tuition, to more complex requests like shopping for competitive loans or finding the best insurance prices. The FlexiPay wallets can do it all. There are no fees for digital transactions and just by using FlexiPay every day, you will earn points that you can redeem at registered FlexiPay merchants. Best of all, anyone with a registered mobile number can use FlexiPay. That's the power of freedom. That's the power of FlexiPay. Live free. FlexiPay is available for both app and USSD. Download from the Google Play Store or dial star 291 hash and register today. This right here is home It is where I belong I know I won't wait long For my favorite song I can tell by the way The sun's coming up from the clouds Tomorrow, it's gonna be a 
better day tomorrow it's gonna be a better day for us improving lives is why we do what we do I think I was using Emma's mic. My apologies. Welcome back. Um, so, if you're just joining us, you've missed quite a lot on compassionate leadership, and we really would like you to, uh, at the end of the conversation, to check out the entire conversation so you're able to watch what you missed. But we are literally discussing um, this compassion leadership value that we would like uh, corporate organizations and every single person that is leading, at least even if you're leading one person, um, to inculcate in their culture. Because it actually changes the lives of the people that work for you, but also gives you results. Um, because um, whatever way you look at it, resilience is possible through compassion and compassionate leadership. And through this conversation, we'll be able to identify for you um, how you can translate your leadership skills into compassionate leadership, um, a leadership that speaks to the heart, as Dr. Uh, PK was saying. All right. So I want to welcome you back. Um, Emma, I, I wanted us to pick from um, the, the conversation with uh, Thaddeus on lessons learned from the pandemic and how Stan Big Bang um, has been able to, to start rethinking the way you do the, what you do to build better. What is it you're, 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 you're picking from lessons learned um, going forward? So if there's one big lesson learned, it's digitization. Uh, we used to always encourage our customers to go digital, to use, to not come to the branches, but to use digital, to access us digitally. And for many people, that was still a problem. They like to fill a form, they want to sign a check. We like talking to people. Uh, we, yes. we are people people. <laughs> we are. <laughs> but we realized that during this time was an opportunity to actually drive digital uh, transformation and digital adoption. And we have seen that our transactions have moved more onto our digital platforms. For example, uh, before the pandemic, we would come and look for you more, spend 20 minutes trying to convince you that you need a loan. Now we'll go look at your data, pre-approve you, and send you a message. Tell you, boss, you have uh, four million from Stanbic at your convenience. And we find that that's why you able to keep up productivity because now you can actually reach out to a cust more customers at the same time. You How was the uptake? I was asking before we were interrupted and told <laughs> we are going back on air. I wanted to get some data. How was the uptake like? Um, you know, because you are, you're going into somebody's SMS. He hasn't actually solicited for the loan, but you're actually telling him. Um, you're not even saying we've looked at your data. No, AI has given you the data, as Isaac was saying, yes. and it's telling you um, this guy is good for 10 million. Mm. And so you send him a text and say, we, are, uh, we, can, we, are, we have approved you for a 10 million uh, loan facility mm. at your convenience. 
So what we've found is um, in our personal markets, for example, a good percentage of our lending has moved to digital lending access, actually. So on the personal side, that's been a bit easier because uh, it's easier to do, to do the, the, the assessment on the personal side. We're doing the same for our SME book as well because, again, if we want to grow really big in the SME, we need to digitize. We cannot hire an army of people to serve that, that space. So, of course, the inputs there are a bit more. The data points are a bit more. But, again, it's a learning journey. You have to be able to take some risk and, 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 and get into that space. So, you find, therefore, that even for our staff, we have to rethink our skills, right? The job used to do before the pandemic has been taken over by an SMS message. So again, we have a lot of online uh, learning that we're doing. We embarked on, a, on a, a process with the Salesforce company to learn future ready skills. Um, for example, all the information I now know about data and um, AI and all that has been through that learning journey. So again, because we're at home, we now have laptops at home, we have data at home. You can even add more time for your learning, for your personal learning and skills development. We found that a number of staff have changed roles. In fact, so many staff have changed roles during the pandemic space because they have an opportunity to do different jobs, to do different roles within the bank. So the bank is mo moving more to technology, more to data management, to mining that data, and therefore the skill levels also have to move. So as we're setting up for the future, it's really to prepare our staff for the future ready, to be future ready in terms of skill set, but also to rejig our distribution network to be more digital. So again, we you know, be able to do the same things, but more digitally. If you think about uh, reaching our customers, we now do a production like this, and only are inviting five people into a room, plus the production crew. Before, we would have invited 200 customers into Serena, and we would be you know, putting up a big buffet. We, that has changed. I don't think we will go back to many of those. We will have some because networking is important, but also for the customer, we realize that we need to save their time. Before, they'll need to be in jam, come to the breakfast, do the networking. It's five hours of your time. Now we're going to have the same quality conversation, two hours, you're, in your, you're at your business or at home, and you still get the same level of conversation that you would get. Of course, it, we miss out on the networking, mm. but we'll have to figure out how that goes forward. But People lessons People were networking learned. online. Um, I don't know how that went. I, I saw tea parties on, on Zoom. Birthday parties and on birthday Zoom. Parties on yes. Zoom. Yes. <laughs> so, so I think um, in terms of ways of work, there have been opportunities to save, there have been opportunities to be more efficient with our time, but also flexibility. I mean, like we said, we're working with people with families. Uh, at some point, you are homeschooling and working at the same time. And uh, probably our children started gaming the system and spending more time on other things. But again, I think during this pandemic, we probably know our families better than we did before. Before, I would leave at 6 in the morning. By the time I come back, I'm giving my family the last dregs of my energy. But now, I spend the whole day with the family. I've connected more with my children, connected more with the spouse, and the housemaid who's not happy that you have more people at home with her now. So that flexibility will continue. You now have a laptop, you have your data, it's now part of going forward, which means I can choose to work two days, in a, two days at home and come in three days because I have proved that I can be productive even if I work from home. So that flexibility will stay. All right, Emma, I know you could go on and on because um, uh, as a bank and at a personal level, there's been a lot of repositioning and, 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 and realigning of some of the work we do. Uh, Tadeo, uh, our people are asking, and uh, you know, on Zoom the question was, uh, So we want to know, um, you know, as Casita, how are you dealing with the issue of rent arrears, and how, we, how are you going to support the landlords? And this question, by the way, is not just for the traders, because as, as you give an answer, I'm sure there's a landlord out there who's wondering how to deal with his uh, uh, residential apartments and, and, and deal with his people who didn't pay during that period, yes. Sure, thank you. Uh, by the way, for rent, rent alias has been so tricky on our side. Like uh, 
uh, the other first session I tried to explain, but maybe I wasn't so clear. But I can try to clarify. As Casita, we tried to rob you with different state agencies and uh, the minister, line minister, even we reached the president. But uh, the government wasn't clear on how they can assist us with different areas. Uh, so when we consulted with our technical team, they told us that there is a real way which we can use for landlords to assist the tenants. Uh, this is uh, through the returns to the tax body uh, that they can declare a loss. Uh, so when we tried to engage some landlords, they accepted, some refused. Uh, so because some landlords were not cooperative, I remember I said that uh, we went to court and we lost the case, they, they were won. Uh, so we are going to pay the costs for the court, uh, but currently we are engaging them, uh, given the fact that uh, Casita is advocating for better working environment in the business community, why should we pay all those costs? And then we are trying to, 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 to train to train our traders, by this some of them have really picked up. Uh, you know, we had the challenge with this, that uh, perception change, uh, perception change, whereby we are used that I have a shop, I have my customers who will come here and buy. So convincing a businessman who is not so teen uh, or in the youth ages, uh, it's not so easy. Uh, but uh, for the youth, you know, our, we have our youth league. It has easily picked up with the digital era. Uh, I think uh, they have also to benchmark. Uh, the elders have to benchmark. You know, they say uh, those things are for the youth. But now that's the, the, the norm of doing business. Uh, we are carrying out several sensitization programs and sessions. Uh, we are having Zoom sessions on a weekly basis with uh, Enterprise Uganda. We are having sessions with uh, mobs, and then also we are partnering with Standing Bank to make sure we do have serious sessions about mind change. Yes. Uh, and uh, savings culture. Yes, yes, because you find that with the digital platforms, you save even you don't worry about rent earlier. So it's cheaper. As Casita, we have developed a platform where our traders can sell at a free cost. And also we are partnering with uh, communication, uh, Uganda Communication uh, Commission, uh, commission uh, because they are developing a national platform. Yes. Uh, we are in partnership, it's called, uh, there is this Exim Bank yes. uh, for due diligence in Africa. We are building a platform where we can easily do business. Here in Uganda, and other countries because, you know, so we, are no, we have that issue of trust. We are not very easy. I can't come here and I tell you that businessmen are trustworthy. <laughs> we have several cases in Casita where Chinese Dubai business colleagues are complaining. When you send goods to Musoke, it gets goods, it disappears. True. So we need, we need to see that how do we change perception change uh, so that because when you adopt digital technology, yes. Yes. you find that the issue of rent is reducing. And even you have now buildings which are not occupied. I, I had wanted you to speak to that because we spoke about that earlier um, mm. when you said the landlords who appreciated the concerns and were passionate, let, let's, say, let's say were compassionate yes, uh, sure. about the you know, traders' issues, uh, gave you a two months reprieve in Even rent. Some, some three. And three. Yes. And those have almost uh, full occupancy. Yes. But those who occupancy. didn't, people actually left their malls. You, you, you didn't share that. And people uh, need to know but, that. But there yeah. is one landlord, I won't say his name. At first he said, for me, they have to pay my rent alias. So what the traders did, they started shifting to the nearby building. So later I told them, now I'm giving you six months. <laughs> six months. So people came back. <laughs> so this time he has been very cooperative. When you call him, he say, ah, chair, you come and we talk. Uh, so you, you find that being passionate is so key in management. And by the way, it can help us as the business community. 
you, to work you, together. You want to share your experience where you had to increase rent? You thought you'd benefit from... <laughs> on my side? Yes. I thought that, uh, uh, you know... Uh, clearly you are not uh, being one, one, one of my rentals yes. was being occupied by a doctor. Yes. So I said, ah, the doctors were making money. Let me increase. These were frontline workers. <laughs> yes. He shifted. <laughs> so getting another one, <laughs> getting another tenant... It took me almost six months until I had to downsize the rate. <laughs> the rate. So it's not easy. You are supposed I, I needed to be you to share that testimony. <laughs> people, people need to know that these stories are real. Um, Isaac, le le let's come to lessons learned. Um, looking back at, at, at the lockdowns and the experience during this pandemic, um, you know, what are some of the things that you've learned as a leader and as a, as a businessman um, that have taught you to be a little more compassionate? You know, before the pandemic, we were on a roll, a high growth trajectory uh, on both our businesses, actually, the trading and the, and the logistics. And um, I think the first adjustment was for us uh, as the shareholders and board to press pause and adjust to, you know, uh, don't lose money, but survive. And that really is, you know, the biggest mind shift. I think it took us in the very early part of the of the of the pandemic. Hey, so we we put on pause everything that we could, mostly on the capital projects. So we haven't bought a single truck the last two years, and we have not built the places that we were building. Hey, because we realized we needed to preserve cash. To keep these people employed, you must preserve cash. So if you're going to preserve cash, you suspend capital projects. That's a one thing. But, but most importantly that when the pandemic, you know, when you figure out how to, to play in the new normal, then you have reserves that you can deploy. And you have the people that you need. Um, so that's a one thing. The, the second thing is really in terms of our, our planning is to diversify. So, so we, we're no longer able to depend on the product mix that we have or the roots as a logistics company. Uh, we're looking for new client types and you know, we've, we've gone uh, in a totally new space in terms of logistics. But also more importantly, I think what, what was interesting is that um, along the way, as we thought about what else we could do, we realized a couple of things that uh, we had never seen, but were always in our client's mix. So when a client comes to buy from us, he goes next door and buys. So those, those spaces we are invading. Again, to invade them, you must have the capital, the capital which you needed to preserve. Uh, but more, uh, we've always, we are now driven by the fact that the most compassionate thing we can do is to create more jobs. And to create more jobs, A, you must survive. And B, when the dust settles, you must be able to invest. So we've preserved our balance sheet. We cleaned, uh, you know, we delayed investments. We made the balance sheet a bit stronger than it was. And, and sold the non, we're exiting the non-core things that, again, to be able to, to do what we, we need to do. Ultimately, become a more uh, sustainable employer a more scalable business. So, so really, I think the, we are fortunate to have not uh, had to lay off people, but I also serve on other boards where it was inevitable. And, and I think either way, you, you do it so that when the time comes, you can hire more people. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you. I'll come back to you know, to all of us at some point, just on, on closing remarks. We still have a few minutes. Uh, doctor, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, uh, your current engagement with the CEOs um, in your coaching and, and your trainings, um, are you doing things differently? Are you telling them to do things differently, given the crisis we have been in? Uh, and what are these things you're telling them to do differently? <laughs> yes. Um what pull pull the mic microphone closer to you so that we can... What, what, do we, what do we share with the CEO? We actually don't tell them anything. But we've just, told, we've just shared that the, the pandemic brings a wonderful opportunity for leaders to learn how to ask. 
and for leaders to learn to have empathy for people, to always step in the boots of the people they are working with, to build a totally new narrative, uh, and limiting the questions to simple questions like, what are we missing? What is our next opportunity? In the midst of the crisis. So what is our, uh, and these are two questions learned from Jeff Bezos, who, who is who is president, really president of one of the most successful companies in the world. The, the question that he asks his board of directors every morning, uh, just what are we missing? What is our next opportunity? That's all. So the, the, the issue now, as we, we, we share with the chief executives is, when you are a leader, you must be willing to consider evidence that contradicts your own beliefs and convictions and assumptions. Uh, and, and also develop the ability to understand that intelligence is not knowing everything, but it's the capacity to challenge everything, you know. That, that's, that's all. So it, it, the lessons that we are picking now for leaders is humility is the new smart. So you, you should not be impervious to learning. Uh, and when you are too full of yourself, then there will be nothing to add because you're already full of yourself. You have what, an exaggerated opinion of self. No, uh, the, when, when there is a crisis like this, you may not suck people, but you can repurpose everything you are doing. Build new skills, upskilling, reskilling, and micro-skilling. Get guys to be relevant, to build a new proposition in the post-pandemic era. Secondly, like I think Isaac mentioned, we, we can't say we are out of the pandemic, absolutely. Uh, we, we don't know the next time around what kind of uh, variant we are going to be dealing with. Maybe at that time we shall have floods. We shall have floating islands. We shall have locusts coming back. We shall have Ebola all at the same time. Now, if this was to happen, leaders need to appreciate that the issue is not planning. COVID has proven what you think, that planning is important but not enough. We need to be just ready. And that knowledge is not the key thing. Imagination is the new thing. Uh, but we used to think that, uh, you know, the big fish eats the small fish. Not anymore. The fastest fish eats the slowest. That, that's how it is. So can we build a readiness within our institutions, build a balance sheet and strengthen it, and, and make sure that our cost structures are actually resilient? We reshape the, in the portfolio that we, work, we are working with and ensure that we build within it safety, flexibility, and productivity to ensure that we can pivot at any given time. I wish there was an opportunity for us to see a, a video clip, which I like very much, of the cheetah, the fastest animal in the jungle, running at 58 miles per hour and able to stop suddenly and pivot and change. This is the kind of uh, thing that uh, leaders now appreciate, that it, uh, readiness is key. Readiness is very key. And that you cannot afford now to work in silos. You, you, you build an economy of collaboration within the institution, plus a moral economy. Because this is the time when people are tempted to steal, to terrorize. It's okay not to be okay. It's okay to fail. Uh, because when you fail, you are in the process of building something new. So during the pandemic, uh, the culture of inquiry and experimentation uh, and, and also discovering new things is the culture that one has to build. And this is a key lesson in the post-pandemic, especially for chief executives. Chief executives must be very humble. They must be able to ask questions all the time. And they must be able to reach out to everyone because they are leaders at every level. They are leaders at every level. So in reaching them out, what are we missing? What is our next opportunity? And what is best for us in these circumstances? Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I, 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 we have about 20 minutes, and, and I'll come round just to ask, uh, just to prepare all of you before I come back to Emma for another question. Uh, you know, what are the, you know, what are the five things that um, you you want to leave behind for um, somebody watching us, uh, whether they are leaders or they are, you know, uh, employees or you know, parents. What are the five things that um, they should look out for to become a little more compassionate, um, or or at least you know, have a value of compassion in what they do, especially if they are leading people or even leading their homes. Uh, because leadership, I was told, PK begins at home also. Uh, we cannot rule out the fact that, you know, the men in the house or, you know, the mothers are leaders in their houses in their own right. Emma, I wanted to come to you now because um, we, you know, many would be asking, so what, 
what exactly is Stanbic doing by, you know, providing these series? What is it uh, that Stanbic is trying to do by promoting compassion in, in leadership? What is it that you're trying to drive as, a, as an organization? Um, are you just showing off? Uh, you know, that we, 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 we know what to do, we know how to do it, and so let's tell you how we do it. Or are you actually saying we're holding hands with individuals so we can actually build better amidst a crisis? So, uh, to start with, it is to say women are more compassionate than men, and therefore we are inviting all of you to join us. <laughs> you jokes aside, um, I think as a business leader, it is, it is, it's upon us to invite others to join us on things we've seen which, which work. Uh, we've seen that com compassionate leadership work for us in the last two years, and it's really to invite the other businesses to join us in this, in, 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 in this way of life because, again, the more good businesses we have in the economy, the better for all of us, right? Um, and if there's best practice that can be shared, I think it's good to create an opportunity to share best practice. But it's also to harness our, you know, the, 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 the contacts or the, the networks that we have. Uh, for example, we can quickly call on PK and say, come and share with our customers your knowledge and your experience. Or call on uh, Isaac and say, we've worked with you, so come and share with, you know, with our customers what has worked for you in this space. I think the knowledge sharing is, is, is an opportunity that, and a platform that we would like to continue to, to, to work with. Um, for a long time, Stanbic has been, a, has been a, a, a front runner in that space, whether it is on oil and gas or on trade or whichever topic we find useful for our customers, we will, we will do the thought leadership there. So it's really continuing in that thought leadership process and, uh, and perspective and sharing what is working so that we can have stronger organizations all around in the economy. All right. Uh, Isaac, I want to start with you. Um, so, you know, we are still amidst this crisis. We are learning new things. Um, I like what PK was saying. Uh, imagination is the new thing. Um, because everyone has been speaking to a new way of doing things. Uh, we have all gone digital in a way or the other. Um, but we cannot lose humanity as we go digital. Because there's no interface amidst us, even as Emma continues to push for digitize, digitize, digitize. Um, that disconnects us from the networking she's talking about. But still, amidst this digitization and amidst this engagement, we must remain human um, to the people we work with, the people we lead, and um, everyone around us. Um, so how, what are those five things you, 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 know, you would be critical to say, we need to look at this and remain compassionate about what we do? Thank you, Maurice. Um, First, as I reflect on COVID, really when, when you know, we first uh, experienced COVID, you see that at the heart of, of the pandemic is, is a threat to life. And, and really, the, you know, we're in this, this world for a very short time, 100 years or so, if you make it. So the first and most important thing is human relationships. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the that we must preserve, you know, with our families, with our colleagues at work, with clients, with, with, with our bankers. Um, there's every temptation to sacrifice somebody at a time like this, a work, an employee, you know, a lender, give them excuses why you can't pay, a customer, you know, you walk away, declare a force majeure, but you could have done better. I think we must try and preserve the human relationships. Because at the heart of this COVID pandemic is the threat to life and the associated relationships. And the next, possibly around it, is the trust. You know, if you look at our own suppliers and, and really many people, the first thing that, the next thing that people did as soon as they finished laying off other people, they cut off lines of credit. Mm. Fuel suppliers, spare parts, you know, everybody became... Overnight, not credible for credit. <laughs> you know, it's a true story. Our drivers were getting half-month allowances from different banks, not standing. And all of a sudden, they came, all of them, to us and said, boss, 
we can't get any advances. We'd stop giving advances because of, uh, you know, there's a bank, why should we? And we had to reinstate it because they have genuine issues. Trust is at its lowest, or was at its lowest, and maybe we need to really focus on that uh, because we are human and we need, we cannot do business unless we trust. And, and also take a long-term view. Yes, we've, had a, we've lost in a way, uh, those of us who are alive, we've lost some business in the last two years, but remember there are people who have lost it all, they've lost life. So, so we, we can be grateful that we're here and, we, and hopeful that we'll be here tomorrow. And we'll see the good days. Oil is coming, as Emma says. I think FID is almost done now. You know, we will, we will forget that we, we, we had this, this shock. So invest for the future. This opportunity that comes out of this challenge can be much bigger than what we're used to. So let's get out of our comfort zone, innovate. You know, who knows, we could start a, other businesses during the pandemic, or we could go online, new channels. Uh, Casita, you know, to, to which I'm, I'm connected th through my partner. The, all the Casita people never thought that you could have a business running for a year without going to China. Yeah. But it's been two years and the shops are full. So, so what happened? We can buy online, right? So let's be positive, let's be open-minded. This, And I like what Pika said, this, this challenge actually opens up huge opportunities, not only for tech companies who are, whose stock is skyrocketing and pharma who's making the vaccines, but in every space you're in, this, this opportunity, look for the opportunity in this storm and you, quick, you will see it. And hopefully, when you reflect five years, five years later, you may be in a way glad that it happened because your business is looking different and, and you personally are looking different. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Isaac. Uh, doctor, I wanted to ask this. Um, in your learnings and in your different experiences, uh, is it true, because someone was telling me, that most of the businesses that were being led by women during this pandemic are actually more successful right now? Is, it, is there a leadership trait we are missing? Are they more you know, <laughs> uh, compassionate. Is, is, uh, do you have any data on that you want to share with well, me? Well, I, uh, <coughs> excuse me, thanks, Maurice. And uh, you, you, the, did, you the, do coach the, a lot of women, the, so the, I know. Yeah, I do. <laughs> the only information I have which is beyond, beyond any co co contemporary scholarly dispute yes. is the fact that the structure of the brain of a woman or a female is different from that of a man. <laughs> and this gives exceptional advantage to women. Uh, a quick survey of the 500 uh, Fortune company, mag companies, the 500 top companies in the world, those led by women, especially in this crisis, posted phenomenal growth, exponential growth. And uh, scholars have been asking themselves, why? <laughs> why are we leading? Away? And the, 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 the answer lies in the brain, that in the brain, the brain of a man, you've got the left brain and the right brain, yes. the thinking and the feeling brain. So, but, the, but in the middle, there is a separation. For the man, it is a very muscular separation, big. It's called corpus callosum. That's the separation. Now, for, for a woman, the separation is so flimsy. In other words, when a, a woman is thinking, she's at the same time feeling. Very empathetic. She's touching the heart as quickly as she's touching the brain. Mm. The thinking and feeling are all at the same time. In the boardroom, in the shop floor, wherever it is. Yes, I'm asking you to do this. How do you feel about it? <laughs> what do you think? Is this going to affect you well? Is it going to affect you? But for a man, no. Do it because we need the money. I mean, we have to produce the money. So why? The, the thinking brain is very different from the feeling brain. That's all I can say from the scholarly point of view. That Pe yes. they, they think differently. Uh, Pika, yes, your five takeaways. Um, you know, doing things differently. Yeah. Number one. Uh, the first uh, biggest takeaway is number one, because I'm coming from the fund, it, it, we, we, did, we, we know one thing that the law of nature and the will of God is that at some point we will all die. And COVID has brought this very quickly to us, that we are not meant to live forever. But the most important thing is what do we leave behind for those who are staying? And that's what Stambi I think Stambik Bank calls that intergenerational wealth creation. How can people like in Casita know very well that whatever business they have, 
they have not actually inherited it from their parents. They have borrowed it from the children. So that's lesson number one. We are not here to live forever. We, we have to leave something for people. Number two, the, the lesson that we pick from COVID especially now is that we, uh, we need to be ready for any given situation. We, we need to build what you call uh, resilience, a mindset that, that, that says I'm responsible for myself. I will not wait for government to give you answers to everything. But uh, the conversation in the home, six hours every, every week uh, 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 in the family, there should be a conversation around how you are spending money, how you are saving it, how you are going to contract debts, and also how you are going to invest. So this is a meaningful conversation around the dinner, around whatever, a new conversation. Mm -hmm. The third one is, uh, we had these two words being used in COVID, essential and non-essential mm -hmm. jobs. So again, that brings a new reality that it's very important to keep learning, learning new things, because we are now in the digital age. We are now dealing, like uh, I think Emma mentioned, we are dealing with the data. Whatever conversation you are holding now, you must bring up data to back your decisions. Artificial intelligence. We are working with now with the data, algorithms, and so on to try and project the future and work through the assumptions. Today, in our boards, uh, we have got robots. Robots are now very much acceptable to sit on the board. Why? Because of artificial intelligence and the capacity to help us. So essential and non-essential skills. That's very important. The fourth one is technology adoptability. We need to adopt technology. And lastly, is build a culture of flexibility and responsiveness. The leader to be there. In a crisis, in any situation, the leader must be seen. And must be seen to be in charge. And must be seen to radiate trust and integrity. That's what will make empathy and compassion leadership sustainable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, I was just reading somewhere when they're saying, fortunately, empathy is not a fixed trait. It can be learned. So all of us can actually learn it, uh, even with that, that muscle between the, the, the two parts of the brain. Um, uh, Thaddeus, uh, let's, let's look at what are the five areas for you you'd be looking at uh, amid this, this crisis. Uh, mainly uh, to the business community that uh, we are supposed to be so creative and innovative uh, because you find that uh, we have uncertainty always. So as you forecast in order to position your, your, your businesses, I think creativity is very, very key. And then, like Dr. said, the technology is so vital. Like Stanbeck has invested seriously in technology. I think we also, my traders, we are supposed to utilize technology uh, so that it has several advantages. Uh, you know, it helps a lot uh, in connectivity with the clients, uh, stock keeping, appraising the, the sales, uh, connecting with the good suppliers and others. So it has several, several advantages. Then I think uh, we need to build trust. You find that uh, most of our colleagues have been affected by consumption of capital. So they need recapitalization. But you find that the easy way uh, you, can, uh, you can raise capital is through joining hands together. You bring 10,000, uh, the other one brings 10,000, you find just within minutes. You have a million, so you can start something small. So when we are together, I think through the pandemic, we can find solutions. And then another issue is that uh, I call upon Ugandans to utilize associations like ASITA, uh, because we try to, to engage different stakeholders. We avail different opportunities. Uh, so in, uh, in a scenario of pandemics, uh, through associations, we brainstorm brainstorm, we consult, and later it helps us to formulate strategies how for business survival. Uh, and then I, I can't say that we can leave the government alone. We at, Cas at CASITA always we engage the government, uh, but mainly through dialogue and then recommendations. Uh, where my traders say, but uh, chair at times you are very soft. But you know, when, when you're engaging the government, you are supposed to have proof and then give alternatives, not only just striking. Uh, so we, we are also trying to see how we strategize as Casita, even to change the perception 
of Uganda, the stewards Casita, before they thought that Casita strikes, strikes. Mm. Uh, but Casita is playing a very vital role in the development of this country. And currently also we are emphasizing diversification, not to put all the eggs in one basket. Can, can, uh, for, me, for me during the lockdown, I used to enjoy my country home in Mokono, where I could not buy matoke because I have. I do farming, I do, I, I do carry out serious farming aside. So you find that when you do diversify, it is survival in such uh, areas of pandemics. I think those are my recommendations. All right, uh, Emma, you have the last word. Um, in, in case I have a minute or two, I may come back to one or two people, but um, the, the five key uh, takeaways for you. So five key takeaways for me were collaboration, instead of hierarchy. Um, during the crisis, we found we got some really great ideas from the teams as opposed to a one-way street where we tell people what to do. So collaboration, but also collaboration as we're doing now is uh, the more people, the more brains you have around the table, the better solutions that, 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 that you have. Uh, second one would be mission and not structure. If we can keep to our mission, we will find that you will find ways of being, um, of, of, of adapting during a pandemic. Third one would be trying out, experimenting and innovation uh, and not being rigid. Uh, because again, you need to be adaptable, you need to be agile, you need to be able to change as, as uh, the environment gives you what it usually does, which is change. Uh, fourth would be transparency. The more we're transparent with, with one another, the better we are. Uh, if, if I have a customer who comes to me and says, you look, uh, this is the projections we made, these were the assumptions we made at the start of the loan, um, the assumptions have changed, and therefore we need to review what I can do. That's a better conversation than looking for you after you fail to pay <laughs> and, 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 and you know, chasing you. <laughs> Because, as, as we said, this is a trust relationship, and actually my fifth one is trust. This is a trust relationship, and therefore we need to all contribute to building that trust. All right. Um, so I have four minutes, I noticed. And uh, PK, I wanted to ask, um, maybe quickly, if you can do it in a minute, uh, or even two. I, I, I can be a bit, uh, you know, um, happy to add. The, there was an issue of mental illness um, during COVID pandemic, and um, because we we were known to hang around people, there's people who stay alone. Who, when they came to work, they had 20, 40 people they talked to, and then Sunday they went to church and another hundred people to talk to, and then COVID hits and you're alone, locked in the house for three, four months, and so we had challenges where people just couldn't connect with the new new normal. Um, is that a, an area we should be looking at as leaders? Yes, uh, I think it's a very important area to look at, especially in the workplace, that people lost connectivity. And quite often, that connectivity and conversation around the water point uh, during the canteen and so on, it built what you'd call a wonderful chemistry among people, uh, making them very... But again, we, we can repurpose the digital connection that mm. we have. Mm. I'm a Rotarian myself. And uh, our fellowships in Rotary didn't stop. So because we harnessed the best advantages we could get out of the digital connection. But, so in but, one day you would But doctor, we pick energies from each other. There was this thing about you being in, in, in the same room with an individual and you're picking off the energy from yes, somebody. Yes, that, that, that's very true. Uh, that, that has been lacking, but you compensate for it. You compensate for it by, first of all, changing and improving the conversation in your own home. Because you, in your home you have people. Right? Uh, so then you can add on the technology support. Yes. Because technology and innovation have really transformed our lives. Mm -hmm. The way we live, the mm -hmm. way we work, and the way we relate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think uh, we, for the circumstances we're working with, the choices were only two, were, were only two that you have self pity yeah. on yourself. Yeah. And self pity is the most destructive non pharmaceutical narcotics. Really. It's <laughs> that. But, uh, but I like why? That. Because it gives you temporary relief. Yes. And it separates you from reality. Yeah. So when you have self-pity, you're actually killing yourself. So you still go out. There, there, there is also appreciation of nature and the environment that cures the soul. Uh, and there is also silence. Silence of the eyes. Whatever you are looking at, what and why or how are you learning? From what you are hearing, whatever you are listening to, whatever you are smelling, 
How is it improving? You, a little more. So silence itself, in itself, is energizing. True. Except that many people think talking is what makes things work. <laughs> but you can keep quiet and listen to yourself. That's a good one. Yes, I, those who make money from talking found a problem. But uh, uh, Isaac, I want you to just have your input before I ask Emma how they dealt with as a bank, dealt with this as a bank. Because she, you supervise a lot of people, Emma. But it's also nice for Isaac. How did you, how would you advise on dealing with mental illness? Because it became a challenge for a lot of organisations. Your microphone is, 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 is you had literally wrapped up. <laughs> um, look, I'm not uh, an expert in mental health, but what I see. Um, working for us is to check in. We make sure that everybody works, you know, is awake at about 9 a.m. It's easy to, for people to hide. But when they wake up at 9 o'clock and everybody stands on their video, you know they are alive. And if there are issues, you have a 30-minute conversation, you'll pick up some things. As a leader, you need to be able to, to do that. And it's a very tempting thing, and I think this is why, in our view, now we're moving office, because the office we had was designed for pre-COVID when we could have a very close fellowship, one next to each other. Now we accept that social distance needs to be but in our budget. So we're taking a bigger office so that every, everybody has a chance to come to work once a week, at least two days. Then you will see, because you can only tell whether people are mentally unwell if you engage them, if, you see, if you see their face. That's true. Um, I think as a... And of course, to make to make it, uh, it's okay to to you know to be, to feel low. Yes. It, what is not okay is for you not to seek help. Yeah. All right, um, Emma. The the finally, you you supervise a lot of people, and um, you know the the fact that we were locked down. Um, some people unfortunately stayed alone. Others, even with family, went into a depression. And uh, we had increased the number of cases of those who were in depression. And, um, you know, some lost their jobs, unfortunately. Um, some lost relatives and very close relatives. Um, so as a bank, how were you able to deal with mental health? So we checked in as well. So before the beginning, whenever we began a meeting, we actually asked everybody, how are you? What's your challenge? So checking in became a way of life. Even now when we see each other, you're first asking, how are you, how is family, how are the children? So that was one. Then secondly, we made it normal that you can be on a conference call, your video on, holding your baby. Because we were in strange circumstances and we had to, we had to accommodate the people around us. So that became normal. Uh, just so you got to know if, if you're in the middle of a presentation and the, the son comes and says, but I haven't eaten food, we allowed you to first sort out that person so that you can be present. <laughs> so that became normal. But we also started having talks on, on, uh, on mental health. We, we, we had talks on grief. We, up to now, we're still having conversations around preparing your estate. We actually lost one of our colleagues to COVID. Mm -hmm. And therefore, preparing your estate was no longer something strange. You had to now talk about it because it can happen. We have seen it. We've gone through it. We held funerals online. We held... Um, so so we, we also have a, a, uh, an online social support uh, company that supports us with counseling. So again, making that more available and saying it is okay for you to ask for counseling, but for your family as well. Because even our families, it became strange. Um, I have a 15-year-old child who was used to going to boarding school and being with her friends. Now she's stuck with you people. And there's, the no one, there's no one her age, you know. But again, how do you empower the parent to have the right level of conversation, to do exercise, to take walks and actually spend time with, with, with the family. So we've been having those conversations ongoing and we're still having them now because they, that even post, okay, so we're not yet post COVID, but even during this time, there's still new challenges coming up. All right, thank you, Emma. Mm -hmm. I want to thank all of you, Isaac, Peter, Tadeus, or Tadeo, uh, and Emma for this conversation on compassionate leadership. Um, as we wrap this up, and we want to thank all of you who joined us via Zoom to um, learn a bit more about being more empathetic and uh, compassionate leadership. Um, I'll pick something from Dr. Uh, PK who said, intelligence is the ability for you to challenge what you know, uh, and that's, that's true. Um, 
listening is in order to understand rather than listening to craft a reply when you're, you know, you're dealing with your, your colleagues. Um, you know, imagination is the new thing, um, which is quite something that I will connect with. And finally, when you learn um, to understand your people better, you will have a workforce that trusts you and feels empowered to help the business achieve its goals. So you need to win their hearts, not really pay for their hands, and that's just not enough. All right, so we want to thank you for joining us on this conversation, a new beginning on Compassionate Leadership, a series with Stan Big Bank uh, that will be continuing, and you will, of course, be alerted when the next series will be on. So we want to thank you for joining us. Good evening. This right here is home. It is where I belong I know I won't wait long For my favorite song I can tell by the way For us, improving lives is why we do what we do.